Hey, this is Ben May with the Sick the Old Past TV program. Thank you so much for being with us. This is a little bit different for us. If you have watched our program that we have had for several years, although we have sort of just resumed it again, this is a little different setting, isn't it? Uh, this is a little more informal. And what we're really trying to do is let you know about some great resources that are available to you so that you can study and deepen and increase your faith in the privacy, the comfort of your own home. We offer several different Bible correspondence courses. I want to share the second lesson of one that I think is one of the most interesting and one of the most needed because it talks about evidences for Christianity. And in fact, the, the formal name is from the Apologetics Press that's located in Montgomery, by the way. But it's, this is the Introductory Christian Evidences Correspondence Course. Kind of a mouthful, isn't it? But it's really a good course. I tell you, our faith is under attack. Now, thankfully, we are still blessed in our part of the country that um, our schools are not as inundated with atheists and agnostics as they are in many places. But we have our fair share. Our kids are going off to colleges that often are very anta antagonistic against faith, against religion. And I think it's more and more important that we understand that we do not follow a blind faith. There are reasons to believe that there is a God. There are logical reasons to believe that. And I think the second lesson that we're going to just briefly go over today, because what I really want to do is convince you that it really be worthwhile for you to order your own course so that you can go back over the things that we'll just touch on briefly uh, in our time together. And um, you can order your own course. You'll have it for your own records. It's really a, a nice um, a nice course. It, it is very much suitable, I think, to keep as a reference. And so um, in the middle of it, just while I have it open here, just show you, you, you take this part out and you answer the questions and send them in. We grade it and send it back. And there's not a passing or a failing. And at the end of the, uh, of the course, which there are 10 lessons, then you will receive a certificate of achievement that's suitable for framing. And so we hope that you'll, you'll take advantage of that. So let's, uh, let's look at this lesson. So again, it, it, it is an excellent study. Uh, on its own, and I think one, again, that is so needed in our day and time. So, lesson number two is the existence of God, cause and effect. Now, what I'm going to be doing, I'm just going to be sharing some parts of this lesson with you, uh, and I hope in doing that, you'll see the value of it, but you'll also see the truth that's behind it. And and so, as we as we look at this lesson, as we go to the to the very first page, it says the existence of God, cause and effect. One of the most basic issues that the human mind can consider is the question, does God exist? Either God does exist or he does not. There is no middle ground. The atheist boldly states that God does not exist. The theist states just as boldly that he does exist. The agnostic says that there is an, not enough evidence to make a decision on the matter, and the skeptic doubts that God's existence can be proven with certainty. But who is correct? Does God exist or not? By the way, those terms that we just used were um, studied in the first lesson. So if you order the course, you'll get that lesson if you didn't hear it uh, from before. And, and those terms like atheist and skeptic, agnostic, all those will make uh, a little more sense. So the only way to answer this question, of course, is to seek out and examine the evidence. You know, the, the Bible defines faith in Hebrews 11, verse 1. The faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
God never intended us just to follow him blindly. As if there was just no proof at all, no logical reason to think that he exists. That's simply not God. And so the only way, again, to answer the question is to look at the evidence. It certainly is reasonable to suggest that if there is a God, he would make available to us evidence adequate to the task of proving his existence. But does such evidence exist? The theist holds to the view that adequate evidence is available to prove conclusively that God exists. However, when we use the word prove, we do not mean to suggest that God's existence can be demonstrated scientifically in the same fashion that one might prove that a sack of potatoes weighs 10 pounds or that a human heart has four distinct chambers within it. Such matters as the weight of a sack of vegetables or the divisions within a muscle are matters that can be verified empirically using the five senses. And while empirical evidence often is quite useful in establishing the validity of a case, it is not the only way of arriving at proof. Now, here, here's an example. For example, all legal authorities recognize the validity of what is known as prima facie case. Such a case exists when enough evidence is available to establish such a high probability of a fact being true that unless that particular fact somehow can be refuted, it is considered proven beyond reasonable doubt. Now, let me pause here a minute. This is why I think it's so valuable for you to have your own copy of the lessons. That's kind of a long sentence. And I think it helped, I know it helped me to go back and, and reread that. Uh, prima facie, you know, that, that's not a word that we use that often, but it, it has a very technical meaning. I looked it up myself when I come across it. That's the, that's the advantage of taking courses. Keep learning, keep growing in your faith. So going on, and it, it is the contention of the theist that there is a vast body of extremely powerful evidence that forms an impregnable prima facie case for the existence of God, a case that simply cannot be refuted. We would like to present here a portion of the evidence that composes the prima facie cause for the existence of God. Now, what the lesson is going to do now is going to go through several different arguments. They will tell you, they, they are so logical. And I know I'm a believer. But I want to challenge you, if you're not a believer, read these with an open mind and see if there's not a ring of truth to it. So there's one argument that's called cause and effect. It's known as the cosmological argument. Throughout human history, one of the most effective arguments for the existence of God has been the cosmological or cause and effect argument, which addresses the fact that the universe, or the cosmos, is here and therefore must be explained. And so here's, here's the argument. The universe exists and is real. I mean, we know that, don't we? Here we are. <laughs> Every rational person, including atheists and agnostics, must admit this point. So the question arises, how did the universe get here? Well, if a thing cannot create itself, then it is said to be contingent because it is dependent upon something outside of itself to explain its existence. The universe, therefore, is a contingent entity since it cannot cause or explain its own existence. If the universe cannot create itself, it must have had a cause. It is here that the law of cause and effect is tied firmly to the cosmological argument. So far as scientific evidence goes, natural laws have no exceptions. This is certainly, this certainly is true of the law of cause and effect, which is the most universal and most certain of all laws. Simply put, the law of cause and effect states that every material effect 
must have an adequate cost. Now, material effects without adequate causes do not exist. Also, causes never occur after the effect. It is meaningless to speak of a cause following an effect or an effect coming before a cause. In other words, something has to make something happen. And whatever causes the something to happen, the cause always comes first, and then the effect. That is why scientists say that every material effect must have an adequate cause. Now, that's an important distinction, an adequate cause. The river did not turn muddy because the frog jumped in, nor did the book fall from the table because the fly landed on it. These are not adequate causes. For whatever effects we see, we must suggest adequate causes, which brings us back to the original question, what caused the universe? Can you imagine something so vast and enormous as the universe? Something caused it? What could be so great as to cause it? Well, there are th only three possible answers to this question, the lesson says. One, the universe is eternal. It's always existed and always will exist. Or, the universe is not eternal. Rather, it created itself out of nothing. Or, third possibility, the universe is not eternal and did not create itself out of nothing, but instead was created by something or someone outside of and superior to itself. So these three possible options, only three that there are, deserve serious um, consideration. So the first part, is the universe eternal? In other words, has the universe has always been here? But the most comfortable question for the person who does not believe in God is the idea that the universe has always been here and always will be here because such an idea avoids not only the problem of a beginning or an ending, but also the need for any, quote, first cause, such as God. However, modern science recognizes that the universe is not eternal. It had a beginning and it will have an end. Now think about that. Scientists recognize the universe has not always been here. And, and the lesson will go on to say why that has to be true. And so they agree on that. Most, there's always somebody. You know, because sometimes if they don't like a conclusion, some will just try to come up with some different somehow, some way of explaining in a way that does not have to conclude that there must be a God. And so among the most important and well-established laws of science are the laws of thermodynamics. Now, don't, you know, don't, don't get bothered by you know, words that we might not typically use. It goes on to explain that the first law of thermodynamics, often called the law of the conservation of energy and or matter, states that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed in nature. The second law of thermodynamics, often called the law of increasing entropy, states that everything is running down or wearing out. Energy is becoming less and less available for use. Entropy, which is a measure of randomness, disorderliness, or unstructuredness, entropy is increasing. That, of course, means that the fact is the universe will wear out. And so the second law points to the beginning when for the first time the universe was in a state where all energy was available for use and an end in the future when no more energy will be available, referred to by scientists as a, quote, heat death, thus causing the universe to die. In other words, 
The universe is like a giant watch that has, has been wound up, but now is winding down. The conclusion to be drawn from the scientific data is inescapable. The universe is not eternal. Eternal entities do not have a beginning or an ending, and they do not run down. One famous scientist, the late Robert Jastrow of NASA, who, by the way, does not believe in God, he wrote this, Modern science denies an eternal existence to the universe. He is correct. We now know scientifically that the universe is not eternal. Now, that, that's an important point as, as we follow some, some necessary conclusions on through in this lesson. Well, if the universe is not eternal, okay, so let's go from there. So did the universe create itself out of nothing? In the past, it would have been practically impossible to find any reputable scientist who would be willing to suggest that the universe simply made itself. Every scientist, as well as every schoolboy, understood the fact that no material thing can create itself. The universe is the created, not the creator. And until fairly recently, it seemed there could be no disagreement on this point. However, so strong is the evidence that the universe had a beginning. And thus a cause superior to itself that some unbelieving scientists have suggested that the universe literally created itself from nothing. You see what they're, they're running across? Their own conclusions based on sound scientific laws lead them in a place they don't want to be. Well, let's, keep, let's keep reading in our lesson. Naturally, such a proposal would seem absurd because the basic principles of physics establish that the creation of something out of nothing is impossible. Be that as it may, those who do not believe in God have been willing to defend it. This suggestion, of course, is in clear violation of the first law of thermodynamics, which states that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed in nature. As Robert Jastrow put it, the creation of matter out of nothing would violate a cherished concept in science, the principle of the conservation of matter and energy, such as the law of thermodynamics, which states that matter and energy can neither be created or destroyed. Matter can be converted into energy and vice versa. But the total amount of all matter and energy in the universe must remain unchanged forever. It is difficult to accept a theory that violates such a firmly established scientific fact. Furthermore, science is based on observation, reproducibility, and empirical data. But when pressed for the empirical data that document the claim that the universe created itself from nothing, unbelievers are forced to admit that no such evidence exists. The universe did not create itself. Such an idea is absur absurd, both philosophically and scientifically. And so the lesson goes on from here. And, and it talks about, well, was the universe created? It says either the universe had a beginning or it did not. But all available evidence indicates that the universe did, in fact, have a beginning. Even scientists, atheists, accept that premise because it's simply the truth. So we go on reading. If the universe had a beginning, it either had a cause or did not. One thing we know for sure, however, it is correct logically and scientifically to acknowledge that the universe had a cause because the universe is an effect. And as such, it requires an adequate cause. Cause and effect states that wherever there is a material effect, there must be an adequate cause. Further indicated, however, is the fact that no effect can be greater than its cause. 
Since it is obvious that the universe is not eternal, and since it is also obvious that the universe could not have created itself, the only remaining altern alternative is that the universe was created by something or someone that existed before or at the same time with it, that is, some eternal, uncaused first cause. And it is superior to it, since the created cannot be superior to the creator and is of a different nature, since the finite, dependent universe of matter is unable to explain itself. So this, this is just a sample of this lesson. We've read a fair portion of it, I guess. And, and we go on, and, and we're not going to read the, the whole lesson, but I'm going to just scroll through it. Uh, when you get your copy, it'll be it'll be in a nice uh, paper form here again that you can read and and reread. And so it, it goes on uh, to to ask and answer other questions. They scroll down to another another section here. Let's see if I can get that. Well, I thought there was one more section. And so, in the conclusion, very interesting conclusion. Um, and so, uh, I'm not, again, not going to try to read all of this, but let me read one paragraph. To illustrate the law of cause and effect, one scientist, R.L. Wysong, referred to the following historical event. Some years ago, scientists were called to Great Britain to study orderly patterns of concentric rocks and holes, an archaeological find eventually designated as Stonehenge. Probably most of us have heard of Stonehenge. As studies progressed, it became, became quite apparent that these patterns had been designed specifically for the purpose of allowing a variety of astronomical predictions. Many questions, for example, how ancient peoples were able to construct an astronomical observatory, how the data resulting from their studies were used, and so forth, remain unsolved. But one thing we know with certainty, the cause of Stonehenge was intelligent design. And so there, there was no other conclusion. You cannot look at all the details of of those rock structures, you probably, in my mind, I picture these big rock pillars in a somewhat of a circle. But they are so precise and they are so aligned uh, with, with uh, reference points to, with astrology that it just could not happen by accident. And, they, and they're like, well, who, who was smart enough to do this and how did they get the stones up here and, and all of that? But they know somebody did. It did not create itself. And I tell you, friends, I, it's hard for me to imagine how anybody can look at the world we live in with all of this wonder and think somehow there was some big explosion and it just all fell into place. It just couldn't happen. You know, the, the psalmist in Psalm 14, verse 1 said, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Bible says the heavens declare his handiwork. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 that, that the Gentiles were without excuse because everywhere they look should say there has to be a God. And so I think a, a, a course like this will help strengthen your faith. You may know someone who's struggling with their faith. Maybe a young person, maybe a college student. It, it doesn't matter the age. And if you think they would benefit from such a course as this, why not call in, leave their name and uh, address and such, and we'll be glad to send them a course as well. Let me just uh, briefly uh, scroll down here and just show you an example of, of the questions. Um, they're not meant to be trick questions. They are everyone in the text. Um, you have some true and false. God can exist and not exist at the same time? You say, well, is that, well no, that's just false. <laughs> the universe does exist and is real. Well, that's pretty evident, is it? True. Well, then something that you would pick up from the lesson that 
maybe you had not thought about before, something that cannot create itself is called contingent, meaning it's contingent on something else, and that one is true, but it's in, my point is, it's in the lesson. Then you have some multiple choice questions. And which of the following terms applies to the universe? Is it eternal? Well, we looked and saw that, no, they say it's running down. Is it self-creating? Could it create itself? Well, no, don't think that happened. Is it independent? Or is it dependent? It was dependent on a cause, wasn't it? And so uh, these questions are, the answers are in, in the text, and some of these we, we have not uh, read yet. And number five, if a material thing exists, then it must have had which two of the following? And so it had to have uh, it had it had to have uh, a beginning, didn't it? So well, I'm not going to give you all the answers, but I hope that you'll you'll take the time to read the lesson. And then you have fill in the blank again. These questions are straight from your lesson, straight from the text. Um, and, and so yeah, we also have some that are, are matching, and and you just match one side with the other. Um, And again, I'm, I don't want to start trying to, to sort these out. Um, some of these I'd have to I'd have to stop and look and um, and see the uh, the answers for myself. It's a really good course that you know it it requires you to read the lesson, but they're again not difficult, and you'll find the answer right there and the text, and then you can make notes and comments if you want to um, ask for more information. If you'd like a further explanation, you just have a question, whatever it might be, then just put it there, and we'll do our best to address your question in a very fair and, and a kind, um, you know, just polite way. So again, I hope that you will take the time to order your course. Again, we just need your name, your address, your phone number. We'll send it right out to you. I think you'll enjoy it. At the end of the 10 lessons, you will, will receive a certificate of achievement that's suitable for framing and just something to recognize your, your diligence in completing the program. Now, prior to this time, we have our, our Bible study format. And I would encourage you to, to, to look at that, you know, to, to tune in uh, on your uh, local cable channel here. Or you can go to our YouTube page, Seek the Old Pass, and you can find these lessons there as well. They, they're, they are for you to benefit from. You know, they, they don't cost anything. They're straightforward. They're, they're not denominational. They're just the Bible. You know, the Bible says the truth shall make you free. And that's what we want. We want to call people back to the Bible. Seek the old past. That's the name of our YouTube channel. That's the name of our TV program. That's the point of these correspondence course lessons that we offer to get people to come back to God, to turn hearts back to the Father. That's what we need more than anything that I can think of. Thank you for joining us. I hope you'll be back with us next time as we look into Lesson 3. A blind man sat by the road and he cried. A blind man sat by the road and he cried. A blind man sat by the road and he cried. He cried, oh.